Okay, so um, I'll introduce our guests, but they've been both been here before um, on multiple occasions. Pastor Ray Jewell, uh, formerly taught at Judson University, and today, not today, to, uh, Sunday, will be installed as pastor at our great name of the church. Hilltop Community Church in Albany, Wisconsin. It's not installed, it's voted. voted. <laughs> the installation will be later. But you're right. So, uh, Pastor Ray will be talking about amillennialism from a different perspective, from an Arminian perspective, and we'll, uh, maybe we'll explore that a little later. And to my left, which seems odd to say, <laughs> theologically to my left, um, Pastor Tim Johnson, Pastor Rock Valley Chapel, and a uh, He's been here before uh, on multiple panel discussions as well. Um, so we'll be talking about these uh, different views. So and at the at the, we'll have some presentations on that, and then I'll ask one question, and after that, it's fair game. You guys can ask any questions that you have. Uh, some of the things we talked about yesterday, or anything during end times. <laughs> And these guys are two very intelligent people, so if you stump them on a question, you know, there'll be homework passes and <laughs> congratulations and cheering and applauding. So. You have to define what constitutes stumping. Yeah. Because I don't know, it's got to be a legitimate response. <laughs> it's my favorite response. I always thought, you know, you did not stump my preaching, so I didn't <laughs> preach guys, is that? Oh. All right, well, let's start off. Um, and... Uh, I meant to flip a coin or something, but... Well, let me, let me ask you this. I've, sure. I've got some handouts. Um, oh, I, I didn't want to give them handouts because they got to write a paper on this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I wanted to write a paper, um, <laughs> but I, I only have 20. So if you want Ray to go first, I'd be fine with that. And then if somebody wants to go run a few more, if we need more, we could do that. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you're fine with that, right? I'm fine so, with that. And... I mean, and then we're going to be happy to defer. Sure. He's got a diagram, I had a diagram, I couldn't find it. We can't do eschatology without charts and diagrams. So don't you <laughs> exactly. How do you get this to be a bigger screen? Yeah. Uh, she moved back. Yeah. 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 Okay. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about style or genre. That's a term I'm assuming you're well aware of in your English class at least, hopefully. The Bible has several different kinds of genre that are in uh, the, the text of it. And so in order to understand Scripture uh, you know, as best as we possibly can, we need to understand which kind of literature the author is inspired by God to use in those situations. There's history, there's um, prophecy, there's apocalypse, there's letters. Uh, there's, you know, Jesus uses parables, and all these different kinds of genre going on. Now, my emphasis in end times talk is primarily based on a study of the book of Revelation when I was in uh, graduate school and seminary. Uh, the main professor for my New Testament studies used the book of Revelation often to help us learn how to study the rest of the, of the New Testament. And one of the things I want to say about the book of Revelation is it's got three different kinds of genre in it. First, you have the prophecy. A prophecy is a prediction. That, well, one person has said, a guy named by, uh, by the name of D.B. Sandy said, prediction is the least prominent characteristic of the prophetic literature. That the emphasis is on prosecution and persuasion. Uh, its function was to make the prosecution and persuasion more convincing. So... Prophecy, biblically speaking, is more forth-telling. Telling a certain people in a certain time this is what's going to happen if you don't change your ways. So when we get to the book of Revelation, the prophetic message has to make sense for the first century people before we can try to figure out what it means for us today. And that's uh, one of the key elements of prophecy. Again, it's telling forth the Word of God, not necessarily predicting the things that will happen, though that is an element uh, in it. But the book of Revelation is also a revelation or an apocalypse. Now some of you guys are really into uh, 
fantasy kind of things, and that would be similar to what I see in apocalyptic literature, stuff that just seems very far out when we read it, but it had some meaning for those who would read it in the first century. Or the book of Daniel has a lot of apocalyptic stuff. So science fiction, that kind of thing, is very similar in style. Not necessarily in content, but it's certainly in style. And uh, you need to keep that in mind as you're reading through the book of, of Revelation, reading in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Uh, and then the book of Daniel, there's a lot of apocalyptic literature that uses uh, heavenly messengers to come and tell people what's going to happen. Uh, and within, you know, generations, or it could be a long-term prophecy, but again, there's usually a reference point to their experience. And then it's also a letter. As you look at the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, it's, it starts out, uh, John, the person that the Lord appeared to, starts it out like a letter that you would read from the Apostle Paul, for instance, or from Peter, from one of the other letter writers in the New Testament. And then chapters 2 and 3 are all specific letters to specific churches in that time frame. Uh, Ephesus, Sardis, and the others that are Pergamum and all the others that are there. And uh, you know, we just need to be careful that we keep that in mind as we look at this. Now, the thing about the amillennial position that I find to be true uh, after studying it for so long is this emphasis on the already and not yet. Um, Jesus, when he died on the cross, won the victory, right? I mean, up until that time, we've got the creation of the world and the promise of you know, salvation for those who are faithful to God and then sin enters into the world and all that. And uh, then we've got the creation and all that. We're yearning the, the sin enters and then everybody is yearning for uh, a return to that uh, bliss that would have been involved in God's original creation. And uh, so we got creation, we got everything going on. Jesus is born. Jesus is born specifically to die for the world, for all who have ever lived, who are sinners, if they come to him. So the way that I understand it, the way that I'm millennials understand it, is this is D-Day. I don't know if Oscar Kuhlmann is the theologian that came up with that idea. World War II, it was a nasty battle. It was a tough battle. You know, it was a war that lasted for five years. But the turning point in the battle was D-Day. Well, that's how I view the cross. The turning point in human history is the cross of Jesus, his death, his resurrection. So after that takes place, he tells his disciples, you need to go into all the world, you got to wait for the Holy Spirit to come and all that happens. And as we read through the New Testament, they continually are faithful to this mission of his that he has set them on. But this is where it becomes, the discussion goes like this. I would say that while we are on this earth, we have those who are in Christ and those who don't believe, or however you want to say it. Okay? So Jesus is resurrected, then we have those in Christ and those who, who don't believe. Sort of like the stair step scenario thing going on. Um, here's when somebody dies, when somebody dies, they go to heaven. Okay, that's a terminology that we use often. Mistakenly, I believe that you know the term heaven in the Bible does not mean eternity. It's the term new heaven and new earth. That means eternity. When we look especially at Revelation chapter 21 and 22, 
Okay? And then this would be hell, and this would be the lake of fire. Now, it's here is the second coming, whenever that's going to take place. And from here to here, until he returns, that is what I would say is the millennium. Where, you know, the amillennialist viewpoint is that that's the whole span of time, because numbers, especially in the book of Revelation, are all symbolic. Uh, unless the context tells us otherwise, but primarily they are very symbolic numbers. So a thousand years, and the only place that we have that reference is Revelation chapter 20. Um, a thousand years is a long period of time with a definite beginning, a definite end. We don't know how long it is. <coughs> Obviously, it's been at least uh, 2,000 years or more since Jesus died and rose again, depending on when... Historically, they, they show that. Okay, so, so here, the victory is won here, but Satan is still active. You know, in a sense, he's bound. He was bound by the cross. He's bound like a dog on a leash. You ever see a dog on a leash? Especially a big dog. You know, my little dog that... He wouldn't scare anybody. He's too small. But uh, you've got, you know, it's like a really big dog, a nasty dog that's on a leash. You get within that, that area, he's going to get you if you're not careful, right? Well, that's what I understand Satan to be in this time. Yes, he's very active, very powerful, but he's still under the control of God because God is all powerful, right? So the thing is, as we approach the second coming whenever that's going to happen. It's sooner now than it was five seconds ago. But I believe that it can happen at any time. Uh, I don't need signs to be fulfilled. I think that basically most things have been fulfilled already in Scripture. Um, you know, there's The Bible talks about the in these last days, or in the last days, and it also talks about the day of the Lord. In the last days is now. The day of the Lord is future. It's the day of judgment when Jesus returns and everybody will be judged. And uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that's interesting that I, that I point to in this whole discussion is we have Peter, and we have Paul, and we have Jesus saying... Uh, the, well, Peter and Paul say the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Jesus says, nobody knows the time of my return. Even the son didn't know. Now, I'm pretty sure Jesus knows now when he's coming back. But at the time he says that statement, he's saying, you know, don't take the time to discuss this. Live accordingly. So the whole point of end times talking in, in the Bible is how does that affect the way you live your life? See, the, the book of Revelation can be signed up, summed up in two words. God wins. Now there's a nice, long, parathetical statement, and we do too if we believe in Him, if we believe in Jesus, if we accept Him as our Lord and Savior. But it always comes back to every time it talks about heaven, or new heavens and new earth, it always comes back to how is that going to affect the way you live your life today? We get out. Yep. Oh, I'm not. Okay. I'm just waiting for you to tell me. All right, Pastor Ted. How much time do you want me to take? About 10 minutes. Okay. Four hours. How are you doing? I'm just going to hand these out, and uh, you can just use these I, if you need to take notes, which it sounds like you do. You can go ahead and write them on here. Um, let me just say a couple things while I'm handing these out. Lots of really good, faithful Christians have disagreed on this for a long time. So Ray and I are going to have different positions on how we interpret the text with respect to the end times. 
But, as Ray has already pointed out, it's faith in Jesus Christ that saves you. It's not your interpretation of Revelation 20 or Daniel 9. That's not what saves you. What saves you is faith in Jesus Christ, okay? So, many Christians are going to differ on how to interpret the Bible when it talks about the end, because the Bible is not explicit about everything. It reveals some information, but not everything. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us that the secret things belong to God, but that which He has revealed for us, to us, is ours forever. Okay, so that implies God hasn't revealed everything. But he's revealed enough, and uh, one of the things he has revealed is God wins. I love that. It's a good way to summarize the whole Bible. God wins. Okay, so at the end of the day, faith in Jesus is what saves you. Your view of the end times will have an influence, however, on how you live your life as a Christian. Does that make sense? It will impact how you interpret not only the Bible, but the world around you. And that will have an influence on how you live your life. Where is your urgency? Where do you prioritize your, your decisions that you make in life and so forth? So it does have an impact. There is significance to what you believe. Okay? Everybody right tracking with me? At the same time, we do not want to say, well, that person doesn't hold the same view as I do on the end time, so they're going to hell. It's faith in Jesus Christ that saves, and that's it. All right, now having said that, there are probably three huge texts. We might even put on this. Huge text that one has to kind of get their minds wrapped around if you want to try to get a feel for what the end times is saying. One of them is Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Very important. That, I would call it, is the mother of all prophecies. That is the big daddy, as it were, when, I talk, when you talk about the end times. A second one would be Matthew 24, which Ray mentioned earlier. Jesus' own comments on the end times. Because the, the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, when are you coming back? And he responded in Matthew 24 with some statements. He gave him some indication, but he didn't reveal everything very wisely. And I would say the third one is Revelation 20. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Revelation 20. If you don't have your Bible, then you have to deal with uh, Mr. Thompson, I guess. Anyone not have their Bible? Anybody need your Bible? Oh. Revelation Oh, this is technically like our old. This is not what? Technically, this is actually not our Bible class. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so you're offering grace, is that it? Yeah, this is called grace. Bit. Yeah, very good. I'm I'm sure. Sure. So, when you think about the four perspectives, which you said you talked about earlier, when you think about the, you talk about four, four big perspectives? We talked about the three main, kind of, okay. little alluded to. Three big perspectives on the end times revolve around how somebody interprets Revelation 20. And Ray referred to it already. He's an amillennialist. Okay? So the big three are amillennialism, premillennialism, postmillennialism. Is that the one? Okay. So you have amillennialists that say, when I look at Revelation 20 and I see it says a thousand years, I take that symbolically or figuratively. It's not a thousand years necessarily. It could be, but at this point we would say it's not because we're long past a thousand years after the time of the cross. And as you saw with Ray, his end time starts at the cross. So it's been more than a thousand years since Jesus was resurrected. So therefore, an amillennialist would say, well, obviously it's not a thousand years because we've gone past a thousand years. So they would say a thousand years refers to a figurative statement for me a long period of time. Okay? A post-millennialist would probably figure around the same kind of thing. Use a figurative uh, description of the millennium. A premillennialist will say, no, we think that means a literal one thousand years and Jesus is going to come back to earth before that 1,000 year period begins. So we're waiting for the 1,000 year period to begin. It hasn't begun. Okay, now under the heading of premillennialism, you really have two big branches. You have the dispensational premillennialists, which is the position I hold to. And then you have the historic premillennialists. Okay? So we're both similar in that we believe Jesus is going to come back and inaugurate a 1,000 year period where he will reign physically on earth. Both the historic premillennialist and the dispensational premillennialist will hold to that view. Okay, and they're holding to that view based on their understanding of Revelation 20. And Revelation 20 says in six different places, Ray is right, this is the only chapter that specifically talks about a thousand years. It just says it six times, so those of us that have tried to interpret the Bible 
as closely to literal as we can and with faithfulness, you know, trying to take context into account, we see this as being literal. A thousand years, and it says it six times. So we see that thousand years, we say, Jesus is coming back, then there's going to be a specific 1,000 years to the day where we're going to differ the historic premillennials and the dispensational premillennials, where we're going to differ is what we do with the rapture, which is something we see in 1 Thessalonians 4. We'll talk about that in a second. Now what I want to draw your attention to in Revelation 20 is not only does it say 1,000 years six different times, but get this, listen to this in verse 3. Um, and through him, this is when Satan's going to be thrown into a pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any long until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Okay? So in that same verse, verse 3, you have a specific reference to a thousand years and a generic reference to a little while. So when the Bible wants to refer to an undistinct period of time in Revelation 20, it says, a little while. So it doesn't use figurative language. It says, a little while. We're not going to tell you how long. It's just a little while. But there's no, like, 60 days or a half a year or two months. So in Revelation 20, in verse 3, we can see both specific language, a thousand years, and generic language, a little while. So therefore, those of us that come to the text say, well, I think when John is saying a thousand years, he means a thousand years. So let's take it literally. All right, so having said that, that's kind of where the premillennials will hold. We believe Jesus is coming back and then inaugurate a thousand year period. Okay? Everybody with me? Check? Hold? All right, so let's take out our handout. So you can kind of see, this is... Not the easiest thing to follow, but hopefully it will give you a sense of kind of where the premillennial uh, position goes, in particular the pre-tribulation, which is another name for dispensationalists. Look on the left side of your page, it says church age. We would argue, again, this is taking Daniel 9, 24 to 27, Matthew 24, Revelation 20, and everything else we can find in the Bible, for that matter, that refers to eschatology, not the least of which is 1 Thessalonians 4, which seems to be an explicit reference to the rapture, which I'll talk about shortly. Taking all that we can about eschatology, this is the system, if you will, that we think the Bible reveals about the end times. Okay? Again, faith in Jesus is the only thing that saves you. Okay? But this is one approach... Uh, that faithful Christians have taken over the years to view what the end times say. You have the church age, which is the period we're in now. That's that thing off to the left. And then you'll have something called the rapture. You can see that where the believers are pulled up on that arrow, and then you see Christ on the top saying, catching up the believers, of, the believers with Jesus. That catching up is a way of talking about that word, the rapture. How many people have heard of the word rapture? Okay, that's a phrase we get in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. And it's the idea that Jesus is going to come back, take the believers up, snatch them up, and they're going to be with Jesus, go with Jesus back to heaven, and then after a period of tribulation, come back to earth with Jesus to defeat Jesus' enemies, and then to inaugurate this 1,000-year period. And you can kind of see that on this chart. Okay, so... We're in the church age. Jesus comes back, and he comes back at a time that we have no idea when. Because he said, nobody knows. I, I don't even know. As, as Ray pointed out, I don't know when I'm coming back. Those of us that hold to this position say, when he comes back to rapture, for the rapture, we don't know when he's coming back. We can't know. It's imminent. It could be tomorrow. It could be before this class ends, which would be kind of cool. All right? But he's going to come back and take the believers up with him, and that's going to inaugurate a seven-year period or could inaugurate, let's just keep it simple, could inaugurate a seven-year period of what we call the tribulation, where there now be God's wrath poured out on earth, but the believers will have been taken up with Jesus. So during that period of the wrath, there will be all kinds of calamities and suffering. People will come to know Jesus in that time, but they will still suffer. But the believers, who were believers before Jesus came back, will be up with Jesus. Okay? Then Jesus will come back at the end of the seven years, and defeat the Antichrist, and imprison Satan 
for a thousand years. And then it, towards the end of the thousand years, which puts us back here on this millennium period, that's what the millennium refers to, towards the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released for a little while, we don't know how much time, and Jesus will defeat him once and for all, and then there'll be that final judgment, which is what that chair is, before we enter into the eternal state. Okay? So, is that about ten minutes? Yeah, about ten minutes. All right, so great. We're going to have questions after that, but I'd like to give you a schematic on sort of one perspective. Okay? All right, right. well, the first question I was going to ask has kind of already been answered. You both kind of mentioned it. Um, the idea that we can have differing views on this topic and still have Christian fellowship. We're not uh, denying the faith. Um, so there's not a, um, we don't need to separate necessarily over this issue. As Ray mentioned before, this is not necessarily a top tier issue. This is not, salvation is by faith, not by millennial position. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll still throw the question out there then. Um, it, you both allude to the fact that it does affect our life now. Even though it's not of the utmost importance, it is important. All doctrine, if it's found in scripture, it's important. If, if God put this in his word, preserved it for us today, um, then it, it's, and it's, it's an issue we have to grapple with. So how do we grapple, how, how important is this issue and, and how does it affect us today? Well, it's important in that it's, the book of Revelation is an encouragement to live through the persecution that happens for believers. Jesus promised us that, you know, hey, they persecuted me, they killed me, they put me on a cross, they're going to do the same thing to you. And we're part of that you. <laughs> and um, so either we are suffering persecution and are faithful through that, or sometimes I wonder, especially in the American church, if we've acquiesced to the culture around us and therefore are not suffering persecution. Because there are more people being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ today than ever in the history of the world combined because there's just a whole lot more Christians around the world than there used to be but they are being persecuted uh, especially in uh, Muslim countries and, and other uh, situations um, so the idea is to remain true and to remain pure and um, we go a long time by I would say there are three there are three things that come to mind quickly on the question of how does it um, have relevance for today. The first thing is how you interpret scripture matters. Um, and, and I'm holding, as I mentioned, that when we come to Revelation 20 and view it literally, uh, that's a, that influences how you interpret the scripture. If, if on the one hand we say, well, we think the thousand years is metaphor, then we have to kind of construct um, a faithful hermeneutic that says, when can, when can I say something is symbolic? When do I say something is literal? When does the context provide enough clues that something must be symbolic? Okay, so that influences how you interpret the scriptures. Does everybody understand that? So I tend to, again, based on what I re revealed earlier, and re revealed, that's too strong of a word, but as I uh, understood or interpreted... Appropriate for the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, thank you. But trying to interpret it earlier with Revelation 20, I think we can interpret Revelation 20 literally because there is both a specific number that's given six times and this generic designation of a little while. So to me, the contextual indicators suggest a literal interpretation is at least faithful. Might not be right, we'll find out when we go to heaven, but it's at least it's not, it's rational. It's reasonable to say we could interpret Revelation 20 literally because there's that generic designation. So the first thing it does is it impacts how I look at the Bible. Okay? The second thing it impacts is Israel. This is something that hasn't come up yet in the nature of this conversation. A pre-tribulation dispensationalist, premillennialist, which is what I hold to, is somebody that says there's still a place right now for Israel in God's plan. And Israel plays a critical role in God's unfolding of history. 
uh, I'm not going to speak for Ray, but in general, uh, millennials will say that, no, now that we're on the other side of the cross, whenever you see sort of a designation, or at least in Revelation, whenever you see a designation for Israel, that really refers to the church. Once again, sort of a metaphorical interpretation. Whereas a literalist would say, well, no, when the Bible is talking about Israel, the Bible means Israel. So having said that, today when you read the newspapers and watch TV and see what's going on in Israel, a pre-tribulation, pre-millennialist, that is somebody who thinks Jesus is going to come back, take the church before the tribulation, then come back with the believers later before the millennium, that kind of person, they say Israel plays a critical role and we need to keep our eye on Israel. Now, people in my own sort of uh, uh, interpretive community can also go too far with that and say, well, we need to go over to Israel and make things happen. And I say, no, 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 you're missing the point. God is still active with Israel. God is doing something distinct with Israel than he is from the church. But that doesn't mean we can initiate something that's going on in Israel. We need to be praying for God's will to be done, but recognize that he's not done with Israel. So that's a huge distinction between a non-millennial position and a, I would argue, a post-millennial position too, although I'm not quite as, I'm a little fuzzy on whether how the post-millennialists would hold to Israel. But there's, that's a huge distinction. So I'm watching what's happening with Israel with different sets of eyes than Ray does. And then the third thing would be the urgency of how we live our lives right now. If we truly believe that there will be a seven year period of tribulation, whether that's three and a half years of chaos, which is the mid-tribulation perspective, or six weeks, whatever the pre-wrath kind of position will hold. The pre-wrath is a little less chronologically oriented, uh, but it's still sort of in that tribulation period. Sometimes God's, Jesus is going to come back. We don't know if it's three and a half. We don't know if it's right at the beginning of seven or right at the end of seven. Still the same kind of context is, it holds. That is to say, if we believe that there's going to be major suffering on earth, unlike anything we're dealing with now, where there's the Antichrist, where we have the whole 666 thing, or we've got to have some kind of connection with him in order to buy food and sell food and all that. Nothing like we can even imagine right now. If we truly believe the world is going to go through that, then we want people to know about Jesus so they don't have to go through that. We want people to know about Jesus Christ so that when he does come back, we'll go up with him. And as 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, we won't have to deal with God's wrath. Because that's one of the blessings. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that one of the blessings of the rapture is it's supposed to give you hope. Hope that your faith in Christ will protect you from this awful wrath that God is going to bring about. Okay? So those are the three things that I think make the pre-tribulation position uh, relevant for today. So it's, it's hermeneutics, how we interpret the Bible. It's how you understand Israel. And it's an urgency for sharing the gospel right now. Which I think Ray and I both hold that urgency. It's the just urgency and what motivation the interpretation. Yeah. And yes, I would disagree with your view on Israel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. Well, um, what happens in these panel, what has always happened in these panel discussions is happening now. Um, our time for questions has become short. So um, let's try to get as many questions as you guys have in uh, for our time remaining. Kaylee, um, we have to keep our answers short. Okay, short like 30 problem. seconds, minute. short. Okay. What do you think the coming of Christ will be? Do you think we'll like raise in the heaven like Jesus, or will our soul will just like vanish from us and we'll just like fall down dead, or like the whole of us will disappear? That's a great question. I really don't know. My guess would be bodily. My mm -hmm. guess is that it would be a bodily. And our clothes will be nicely yeah. folded. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I would agree with I would agree that it will be a bodily resurrection and it'll be a resurrected body according to First Corinthians fifteen. Yeah. Right now. Um, I just want to know where in the Bible does it talk about the seven years of tribulation? And it's in Daniel nine, twenty four to twenty seven, that first text I mentioned. It's it's Daniel's prophecy of the seventy weeks. Sixty nine had been fulfilled. It's very complicated, but sixty nine of those seventy weeks, based again on your interpretation, being fulfilled in the time and death of Christ. And then there's the seven weeks that's still out there, and it's either connected to the other sixty nine, which is what an amillennialist would hold. So therefore, saying, all right, seven weeks. That other seven weeks had to happen right after 
uh, the crucifixion or the resurrection, uh, more accurately. And then there are those of us that say, well, the seven weeks is not necessarily directly attached to the 69. It's still yet to come. And so we're waiting for that seven week Which period. Which is interesting because I study, you know, I have already not yet, and you're yet to come using yeah. using amillennial terminology for your view of the seven weeks. But I, from my understanding, it's been a while since I've looked at that particular passage, but I think it is a reference to uh, the time after Jesus resurrected until the time of Pentecost. Yeah, so the that's all. and really the critical turning point on that interpretation is the, the prince of the people to come. That's the real critical time. Did that prince of the people to come happen right after Jesus' resurrection, or has that not happened? That's really kind of a sticking point about yeah. when that happened. Alright, um, so the events in Matthew 24 are the signs of the end of the age. How do you view those? Do you see those as things that have already happened or yet to come? And what evidence is for that? Both. Depends on, depends on the context. It depends on how you would read it. I mean, we don't have the time to <laughs> go into that, but I, uh, there are certainly some things that were going to happen immediately. Uh, you know, the, the destruction of Jerusalem happened within a generation after Jesus talked about that, uh, when the Romans came in 70 AD and, and destroyed it. So that part of it is, is there, but then there's also some of the other things that will happen uh, in the future. I generally I pretty much agree, but lean towards the future. Those things are yet to happen. He's talking to Jews. Uh, that's the way a pre a pre-trib person, he's talking to Jews in particular, not to the church. And so there's still this Jewish context that has yet to be created, but will come about. Therefore, uh, pre-tribulationists would say there has to be an Israel, which we're, we see now. And Israel as a country has only been around since 1967. So that's why a lot of people think we're in the end period, because wow, Israel's existed. Uh, also think that there has to be a temple a third temple that has to rise up in order for it to be destroyed to then fulfill what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. I need so, to say something real quick. Israel and the church are all the people of God. So I'm not convinced that the nation of Israel needs to be there for Christ to return. There are several other prophecies that need to line up. Yeah, you, you talked about immediacy, but the, the people that I know think that certain other things need to happen yet, and yeah. I'm of the opinion that, like you said, I, I was surprised to hear a premillennial person say that, he could happen, it could happen today, it could happen this second, that's where I'm at, and it is giving me an urgency to, to proclaim, as does my Arminian perspective <laughs> in theology, <laughs> gives me a, 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 an immediacy and an urgency to share the gospel to the people of God, but also to share it with those who need to know Jesus. For and so, Pastor, you would you would disagree in that, in that Israel and the Church are separate entities? Absolutely, right. Israel and the Church are separate. But um, we believe that at the end of the tribulation, there'll be a massive conversion of Israel, in which case there will be the merging. But until you know that we're all the Church, because obviously the Church constitutes those who believe in Jesus. So, a Jew today. Somebody who's Jewish today and believes in Jesus is part of the church. But God is still going to do something with the physical entity of Israel, not the least of which, and probably most importantly for this discussion, is the land of Israel, which goes back to the promise, what we think is an unconditional promise, an uncondition, unconditional covenant with Abraham. You remember back in Genesis 15 and 17 when God promised Abraham posterity, blessings, and land, and in particular, Genesis 17, God says it's an eternal promise. I want to so jump in real forever. quick. Libby, you had great to try to get one last question. Um, Belton, you're about two minutes. How did, how did like 666, like how did that become like the mark? Okay. The, again, there, here's where a figurative number is used. Um, the study that I've done on that is, first of all, it's only used one time in all of Scripture. Second of all, John is trying to write this to the seven churches of Asia. The threat to them for their faith was Rome at the time. And there was a cult that had developed around the emperor. You could hold to any belief that you wanted to believe as long as you said that Caesar is Lord. And the Christians would not do such a thing. It's a reference uh, from my study of that to Nero who was Caesar and was willing to 
he burned Christians for torches in his gardens at night and blamed Christians for burning the Rome and uh, that there was a thought that he had come back in another evil emperor by the name of Domitian and that's just John's way of saying watch out for this guy. Pastor Tim, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna, the bell's going to ring so we got the bell rings just stay. Um, I'm going to give you the last word. So you got six, the first six, word. Six. And uh, anything else you want to wrap up real quick? Well, 666 could also be a reference to 7 is a number of perfection. So that which is close, but not quite. And if you read through carefully with uh, Revelation's description of the Antichrist and of uh, the woman of Babylon, there is an apostate sort of perspective on the Trinity. So it looks like it's Jesus. You know, the Antichrist can come back and do miracles and say, I'm here to help you. But it's not Jesus. So 666 could refer to that. I'm close. I'm trying to appear to be, but I'm not. So there, that's one, another way of saying of what 666 could be representing. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Pastor Tim, Pastor Ray.